in many ways, we've been a lucky species. And I think if we went back 100,000 years, there were four or five different kinds of humans around on the earth. It might be difficult to pick any one of them out and say, these are the ones who are going to be successful and end up taking over the world and the others are all going to disappear. When we look, for example, at Britain, over the last 900,000 years, it looks like there were probably at least 12 separate occupations of the British Isles by humans. Probably four different species were here. All of those earlier occupations, 11 of them at least, disappeared because of severe climate change. If we need a more global explanation for why we're the last ones, we've got to talk about why Denisovans disappeared, why Homo floresiensis, the so-called hobbit, disappeared, Homo luzonensis in the Philippines. I think luck is certainly part of it. And I think we don't necessarily know the full story. Obviously, if you're going to survive, you have to have enough population numbers, you have to have enough genetic diversity to see you through crises. These earlier species, they've got a, a larger physiological load. They probably were more demanding of the environment in terms of the calories. And that means that in any given environment, actually you can support less people. To begin with, of course, Homo sapiens spread out of Africa in very small numbers. And many of those early populations of Homo sapiens, we think they died out too. So Homo sapiens wasn't guaranteed to have success. Who knows what the future holds? Uh, I don't think we've got any guarantees of, of long-term success, even for Homo sapiens, we'll have to see. Scientific technological change has obviously had a huge impact on human evolution and our studies of human evolution. When we're looking at recent forms, of course, we've got their DNA, we've got their external morphology, coloration, really detailed knowledge of where they live, how they interact with, with other species. When we go further back in time, of course, material's less complete, but in the future, we'll have new techniques coming online. At the moment, uh, many of us are hopeful that proteomics will have an impact on the field. So one of the problems with DNA, of course, is that through time, of course, DNA decays. And once you're back more than 100,000 years, it gets very difficult to find any DNA surviving, even in the best environments. Denisov Cave is exceptional because there we've got DNA going back a couple of hundred thousand years of the Denisovans. But in places like Africa, in tropical and subtropical environments, of course, it, it, it rarely preserves uh, with any time depth. So people are looking at fossil proteins and proteins survive better through time. Of course, there's less information in those fossil proteins, but hopefully, if that's successful, we will start to build up a network of relationships just as we have with the DNA for us and the Neanderthals and the Denisovans. Perhaps we'll eventually be able to build up a protein relationship network, not only for Denisovans and Sapiens and us, but also for Heidelbergensis, for some of these earlier species, Homo antecessor and so on. Let's hope that works because it, uh, we need all the help we can get when we get back beyond a couple of hundred thousand years. And it also solves some long lasting problems such as Homo floresiensis. Is that a dwarfed form of Homo erectus or is it something much more primitive and evolved from a pre-human stage? The proteins, if they're preserved in floresiensis, could help us. And Homo luzinensis too. Homo naledi, of course, this puzzling species from Southern Africa, about 300,000 years old, shows a very strange mixture of human and non-human characteristics. So it would be great to get proteomic data from Homo naledi to see where it really falls. Another technical advance, which has just come up in the last few years, and I'm sure will become more important, is the fact that it's now possible to recover DNA from cave sediments. So we know, of course, that the Neanderthals and the Denisovans range much more widely than the fossils we have indicate. So there are big areas, for example, of Asia, where we have stone tools and we don't actually know who made them, which species made them. So in the cave sediments, where those tools are, there may be remains from human DNA. The makers of those tools could have left their DNA behind. Maybe they died in the cave and their bones have disappeared, but the DNA is still there. Perhaps they just urinated in the cave. Uh, maybe a woman gave birth in the cave and that would have left DNA traces. If those could be picked up, we'll be able to map much more accurately the range of these ancient species, how they overlapped, uh, where they came together and overlapped. And we know Denisovans and Neanderthals were overlapping at times in Siberia. So we'll be able to map that much more precisely if we have cave DNA. And then when we push even further back, the origin of the genus Homo, we don't really know when and where our genus originated. Uh, we don't know the ancestor for our genus. And pushing it back even further, when did the whole 
human line, the hominin line, originate. Geneticists estimate it could have been seven million years ago that we shared a common ancestor with our closest living relatives today, the chimpanzees. But have we fossils that actually represent that early evolution? Uh, there are ones from Africa which some people believe are on the human line, but I don't think it's clear yet that they really are on the human line. Uh, they could be, uh, but equally, uh, there must be ancestors, of course, for chimpanzees out there somewhere and for gorillas out there somewhere. And we know about the diversity in the last couple of million years. Maybe there was also diversity, you know, five to seven million years ago, and many of those were branches that ultimately failed. Perhaps we haven't even found the earliest members of the human lineage yet. And that will be exciting if we can identify them.